Jorge of Lent in Wiggins, Mississippi. Announcements for the good of the gathered body of Christ. Thank you for gathering with us by means of technology and those who have assembled here in worship, and especially for the communion of saints. We give thanks and praise. Pray every day at noon uh, for the world, uh, which the Lord still has in the palm of his hand and is ever present with us. But especially pray for those in the medical field and those who are in uh, service through institutional institutions of care and need. Check on two people every day. Uh, especially check on those individuals uh, that do not join us by Facebook uh, and are not receiving emails. Uh, so uh, you know who those individuals are. The Holy Spirit is confronting you with their names. Uh, pay attention to the Holy Spirit's movement in each of our lives. Please remember your gifts and your tithes and your offerings to your covenanted community of faith. Uh, about a week ago, we mailed a self-addressed return envelope with a stamp on it. Uh, if you would do that, please let us know. And uh, also, if you have Easter lily forms, uh, you may mail those in, you may call them in, or you may email them in to us. They're $15 uh, per lily. On Easter Sunday, we will have a living cross in the parking lot, and uh, that will be a wonderful witness to the world in the troubled times that we live in. We would love to hear from you as we broadcast, just to let us know that you're listening and paying attention. Uh, give us your favorite scripture or the witness of where God has been real in your life since we last gathered, and uh, that would support and strengthen each and every one of us through this time of solitude. Join with me. I pray that you have this second verse of blessed be the tie in your hearts and in your spirits as we move through uh, the days of Lent. Before our Father's throne we pour out ardent prayers our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. And let us pray. Creating God, in the stillness of this moment, how we thank you for your presence. How we praise you that we hear the birds singing sweetly the melodies, that your eye is watching over each and every sparrow, so we know that you are watching over us. We have reason to give you thanks and praise. Your love for us so great and so compassionate that you would become one among us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who indeed walks with us and talks with us, and by and through your Spirit reveals to us the truth of life and for the facing of these days. For all the ways that you have surrounded us and supported us with your grace and your love in your providential care, we give you thanks and praise. We ask in the name of Jesus that indeed you would continue to speak storm, speak peace into the storm of the troubled world that we're living in. Continue to bring wisdom and discernment in the lives and hearts and minds of those who are in the medical field. Re-energize the bodies of those that are working to create masks and gloves and all the supplies that are needed in the medical world. 
how we thank you for those that are learning to sew masks together in the privacy of their homes. All around us, Lord, you're revealing yourself to us. When you ask us to be still and know that you are God, you are manifesting it on wave after wave after wave. Indeed, in the hearts and minds and especially the bodies of those individuals that are tired and weary and worn out in, medical, in the medical field, in institutions of personal care, in those that are caring for their loved ones in the privacy of their homes, police stations and fire stations, all those, Lord, who are working and serving around the clock, be with them. Encourage them. Call us, Lord, to be your people. To love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We thank you for all the advances that you have provided in the world that we now live in so that we can worship you through media that our grandparents absolutely had no idea could come about. And we thank you for the seeds of faith that they planted into each and every one of our lives so that we could come into your house through the privacy of our homes and offer our lives as living sacrifices to you. Find us faithful, Lord, for those that indeed will follow us in the years to come. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. For we ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is our Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. your 
Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at verse 1 and continuing through verse 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me. He took me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many of them spread over the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, O mortal, can these bones live again? And I replied, O Lord God, only you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live again. I will lay sinews upon you and cover you with flesh and form skin over you. And I will put breath into you and you shall live again. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I prophesied as I had been commanded, and while I was prophesying, suddenly there was a sound of rattling, and the bones came together, bone to matching bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had grown, and skin had formed over them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy. Say to the breath, 
Thus said the Lord God, Come, O breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live again. I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath entered them, and they came to life, and stood up on their feet a vast multitude. And he said to me, O mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are doomed. Prophesy, therefore, and say to them, Thus said the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and lift you out of the graves, O my people, and bring you to the land of Israel. You shall know, O my people, that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves and lifted you out of your graves. I will put my breath into you, and you shall live again, and I will set you upon your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have acted, declares the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And join with me in the Apostles' Creed as we affirm our faith in the living God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So indeed, grace and peace, and thank you for your witness. The season of Lent requires that we wrestle with life's greatest obstacle, death. John's great declaration of God's redeeming love becomes prophetic fulfillment on Good Friday. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But before the disciples of our Lord then and those that follow now may rejoice, we are faced with the question asked to Ezekiel. Can these bones live? The valley of dry bones question is also found in the teaching or the witness of Jesus in John's resurrection of Lazarus' story. Jesus says to the disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Jesus is asking the disciples and each of us that profess faith, can these bones live? Later in the gospel story, the question is revisited. Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to Martha and to each of us, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Can these bones live? We're encouraged as we affirm this question of life. Because before our Lord gave himself up for us, he told us. But when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Spirit or breath, verses 6, 9, and 10 is spirit in 
John's gospel, in Ezekiel, sorry, is the focus of the verses found in Ezekiel chapter 37. All of our life, we are on a pilgrimage. We are heading toward the fulfillment of the question, can these bones live? But in particular, the 40 days leading up to Easter should call us to a deeper accountability regarding our faith, our belief, our salvation. Our pilgrimage will only be as strengthening, encouraging, hope-filled, and alive as we have applied ourselves. If we have not prayed, if we have not fed on the word of the Lord, if we have not meditated, fasted, participated in faith, then we may not be faith-filled or spirit-filled and be able to answer the question that God poses to Ezekiel and to each of us. Can these bones live? Why will we not have an answer if we have not participated? Because where there is no faith, there is no obedience. And if there is no faithful obedience, then there is no spirit. The prophet Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones places before us a less than this day you will be with me in paradise scene of joy. It parallels the season of Lent and in particular the final days and hours of our Lord's life. The pilgrim cannot rejoice until she or he arises in the dark hours of morning and goes to the place of the dead. It is a journey. The psalmist stated it for us. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Ezekiel states, The hand of God was upon me, and God brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. In Hebrew, it actually states that God deposited Ezekiel there. And verse 1 points that out by finishing this astounding statement with, and it was full of bones. This is overwhelming. It is overwhelming to Ezekiel, and it would be overwhelming to every one of us. You see, if God is going to take me somewhere, I would like for God to take me to Hawaii or to the top of a mountain. Better yet, God, take me in your spirit as you did John and give me a revelation. Our Lenten journey does indeed take us somewhere, somewhere greater than we could ever understand through our physical being. But in order to arrive at the sun-lit, hope-filled joy in the morning, we must walk the road of serving, the road of sorrows, and the road of sacrifice. Our Lord went in that direction, and we are to follow him. Our answer to the question, can these bones live, addresses our spiritual being, our soul. God set or deposited Ezekiel down. I don't know if your parents ever set you down. Perhaps some of us from another century had parents, teachers, law enforcement agents, or a preacher that told us to deposit yourself right over there in that chair. I heard those exact words a couple of times, and that is all it took. I deposited myself. I was overwhelmed. But more importantly, my parents or that wonderful old teacher now had my full attention and I knew who was in control. It was not me. God has Ezekiel in control. God deposited Ezekiel. And God says... Let me show you around this real estate. Again, it is not a beach, 
nor is it a mountaintop. They walk around in the midst of bones, dead people, not even buried. You see, if they were buried, the bodies would have been cared for. <coughs> people that loved them remembered them, even in death, and they were concerned about them. We could even say from our own era that there were some faded plastic flowers strewn among the broken tombstones, had they been remembered. Ezekiel stands in a desecrated cemetery. Ezekiel is struck by the number of bones and how dry they are. The bodies have been left uncared for, and they show the cycle of deterioration due to the harshness of the elements. Life. If you were paying attention, Marie just sang about it. The difficulties of life, especially when we are not placing our lives in the care of the Lord. It is not a place of remembrance. It is a scene depicting the reality of death. In the early 1970s, Dr. William M. Bass, an anthropologist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, conceived the very first body farm. Bodies are left in the elements to decay so that the body can be studied. There are now several body farms located around the world to aid in forensic science. So Ezekiel is shown a body farm, but for a spiritual, life-giving purpose. That is our scene, our landscape, that we are walking in with Ezekiel. If you need a Lenten discipline, Spend some time feeding on this text over the next few days, seeking the Holy Spirit's instruction and direction. In the midst of the dead people's bones, God says to Ezekiel, Mortal, can these bones live? Yes, I know there are some translations that say, Son of man, can these bones live? That translation is not misleading. It simply gives us the option of considering Jesus. The Hebrew text <clears throat> puts the real in the reality of this graveyard body farm where we are. And it confronts death. Now the reason we do not like to go to cemeteries is because cemetery, cemeteries confront us with our own mortality. Death is confronted for Stacy. Death is confronted for each and every one of us. As we stand in the cemetery, we hear the question, You, mortal, you, you have a terminal diagnosis. You are going to die. Can the bones live? This is the ultimate question of Christianity. And the season of Lent confronts us with the question and says, now you must deal with it. We cannot get up in the dark hours on Easter Sunday and put on our best clothing and attend sunrise worship without dealing with Good Friday spiritually. We're going to die. Our lives are terminal. So we look at the life of Jesus for help, for hope, <coughs> excuse me, and answers. Jesus says to us, you must take up my cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And if you do, you will die. If you learn my teaches and live into their fullest reality, you are going to be willing to die for someone else because I have told you to do this for my sake. 
The Spirit of God is going to call you into this valley of dead, dry bones and ask for a response to the question, mortal, can these bones live? Excuse me. Christians no longer like this type of theology. Nor do we like to submit ourselves to this obedience. We're postmoderns. We like Christmas because it births a baby. We like Pentecost because it is the birthday of the church. We like fellowship suppers and weddings. We do not like Good Friday. We do not like dying for our Lord's ministry and mission. And our loss of this sacrificial living, this spirit-filled living as disciples, is why congregations are getting smaller and smaller. And yet all around us, right here in the Bible Belt of the USA, We are standing among countless dry bones. They have physical life, but truly have no spiritual life. I am reminded daily that I am standing in a graveyard of dead people every time I watch the news. Someone else has been shot. Someone else has been killed because of a drunk driver. I see it every day up and down the Talladega 500 right outside these doors. People cannot leave their addiction for a drug alone. Their bones ache for the drug. In our schools, teachers that we once respected and held in places of honor now sleep with their students and keep their jobs. And we certainly don't want to discuss the levels of degradation among clergy. Terrorists in wars just blow the bones apart to leave countless dead and thousands walking around with no bones left attached to their body. So on Tuesday, standing in front of me, I see a man with no arm, and I am pondering the question, can these bones live? And I hear God saying over and over, mortal, yes. I hear God saying to me and to each and every one of us, you in your comfortable chair, complaining because the final four has been canceled. You, lazy and drug-induced from beer, to such an extent that you can't stand up? Answer the question. You that are so fear-ridden that you are sleepless and stressed to the max, whatever our position in life, the question comes to us, can these bones live? I do believe the Spirit is saying to the world right now, clean yourself up. And enter God's house and worship God in spirit and in truth. And then, we hear, we read, or we state the most human answer or the most insane answer in the entire Bible. It is Ezekiel's response to the question. O Lord God you know. And just like that, we are back in the Garden of Eden. Ezekiel tries to pass the buck to someone else. But since Ezekiel does not have Eve to blame, he seems to try to blame God. That's the insane part. We should never blame God when we find ourselves standing in the middle of a cemetery. Our God is not the God of the dead, unless we choose death rather than life. I am going to give Ezekiel a break on this. If I were deposited in a cemetery surrounded by dead bodies, I would probably go with the same answer. 
But God wants us to live this answer. Jesus wants us to live this answer. The Holy Spirit wants us to live this answer. The three in one will show us and give us all that we need to live the answer. So Lent calls us to reach way down deep and seek the answer. Ezekiel's response could have been fear. It could be hesitation. It could be resignation. And it could be the absolute assurance of knowing the Lord. You know, God, that I know that you know that I know. Everyone moves in and out of these stages of faith. Fear, hesitation, resignation, knowing. But often we give up trying and resign from ever visiting a lonely person. Preparing a meal for a shut-in. Putting a dime in the offering plate. Saying a prayer for someone in need. But if a disciple of Jesus lives in fear, hesitation, and resignation, then we affirm the wrong answer to the question. We actually say, no, Lord, these bones cannot live. And I do know that there are a lot of individuals that say they are Christian that affirm that response. I am certain that is not an issue at Calvary. That is why there is a Calvary. The spirit-filled disciple knows that he or she cannot and must not affirm in the negative because we have found ourselves at the foot of the cross knowing that God is saying yes. The Holy Spirit deposited us at the cross. And from that standing point, we journey, knowing that the Good Shepherd is leading us through the valley of the shadow of death. Is this the same valley of dry bones? I don't know. But I do know the disciple knows that prayers have been answered. The disciple knows that there is food on the table. There is a roof over our heads. A job has been provided. All the test results came back negative when we were told that we only had a few months to live. If none of those affirmations are prevalent in your life, then thanks be to God. God still sent his son to die for you. And just so you know, the fully human Jesus did not want to die either. We are soon going to encounter Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asking God to let this cup pass. There is a level of affirmation in each of our responses to the question. Some secure a brighter alternative than others. God wants his people to affirm, not live in fear, not hesitate, not resign. Oswald Chambers, in his great devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, had these words to say yesterday, March the 8th. Faith is not intelligent understanding. Faith is deliberate commitment to a person where I see no way. If I were in a cemetery surrounded by dead bones, my intelligent understanding would be to run for the nearest exit. But God's people follow in obedience where they see no way. The children of Israel stand at the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army advancing. Jesus prays in Gethsemane with Good Friday dawning and his disciples asleep. God will provide. Our spiritual disciplines and especially our Lenten disciplines should reassure this truth into our spiritual bones to encourage our faith-filled, spirit-led pilgrimages. Ezekiel is told to prophesy to these bones, and we are given an account of regeneration that reverses the decomposition process. The bones reconnect into a skeleton, sinews, 
tendons and muscles are formed and they wrap around the dry bones, giving them shape and detail, and then skin covered them. And Ezekiel was told to prophesy to the breath, Ruah, the breath of life that comes from God. Genesis 2 verse 7. I stated earlier, spirit or breath is the focus of these verses found in Ezekiel 37. Lent calls us to extend, enlarge, deepen our spiritual disciplines. The early believers were called to go out and find the lost sheep during Lent. That would be those that have fallen from grace, fallen through the cracks, forgotten. You see, they have very dry bones. Lent is not about giving up chocolate, nor some silly infantile 40 days of losing weight. Those are about being selfish. <clears throat> Why? Because our Lord, our leader, and our example left 99 behind to go find the one lost sheep. Where did Jesus get that idea from? He found it from some silly old book that many say doesn't matter anymore. Ezekiel. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Almost daily, I find myself in the pastor's study going through everything possible to locate a lost sheep. Spirit always deposits me. And spirit says, calm down. And I say, shepherd me, Lord. And Spirit says, go be a shepherd. I remember walking to a, into a hospital room with a bulletin newsletter and upper room in my hands. And the dear lady looks at me and states, I have been waiting on you. I hand her an upper room. And that simple gesture brought tears, life, joy, her bones remembered. Tuesday of this week, same day I saw a man with no arm, I'm asked, preacher, did you know? And I said, no. Who is so-and-so? What do I find myself almost daily doing? Seeking lost sheep. Spirit always deposits us. Spirit always says to us, calm down. And those that are truly pilgrims say, shepherd me, Lord. And Spirit says, go be a shepherd. We have two weeks to speak life into bones that are broken, decaying, lost. God said, Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from four winds. Breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, and he commanded me, and the breath of life came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love. And do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on us, breath of God. 
until our hearts are pure, until with thee we will one will to do and to endure. The Almighty does not do stunts to impress or entertain us. The Almighty is a God who seeks to bring us into covenant in order that we may experience saving grace firsthand. But in order to live in covenant, I have to prophesy to my dry bones, breathe on me, breath of God. The God we serve works to redeem us, transform us, breathe life into our broken, dry dead bones and then sends us to go and bring life to the dead bones all around us. Yes, prophesy, witness, seek lost sheep. We must be convicted that indeed God can affirm through our living the answer to the question, mortal, can these bones live? I pray your answer is yes. If you have never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, he is here, he is with you, and the Holy Spirit is depositing you at the foot of the cross. Pray. Seek, ask. Over and over and over, not just one time, over and over and over, as long as we have life. Our prayers surround you. If we can shepherd you, please let us know. Let us pray. Indeed, God, you are the great shepherd, the creator of heaven and earth, the giver and the taker of our lives. Help us, Lord. Remember our bodies, Lord, and send us forth. Find us faithful to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory. For we ask this in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and may the eternal God, the great shepherd, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.